Cool. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for your time today. And thank you to the Lightworks team for allowing us to be part of this event. Uh, my name is Jamie Franklin, and I am Partner Development Manager for the West. I've been at Jabra for three and a half years now, but I've been in the industry for over 25 years. And like many of you, I've seen a lot over the years, uh, but the impact of AI is in a category all by itself. So for those of you who have never heard of Jabra or GN, just a little bit about us. Um, GN is our parent company based out of Copenhagen, Denmark. Under the GN umbrella, we have our sister company, Resound, who makes hearing aids, and of course, Jabra Professional Audio, Video, and Software Solutions. Uh, we have an incredible history, over 150 years of innovation and insight. Uh, we have 7,000 employees globally and market our solutions in 100 countries. So I saw an interesting quote from Bill Gates. Quote, how will you interact with your agent? Companies are exploring various options, apps, glasses, pennants, pins, and even holograms. All of these are possibilities, but I believe the first big breakthrough in human agent interaction will be earbuds, end quote. Uh, this quote highlights the transformative potential of voice interactions with AI. Gates envisions a future where speaking to AI becomes the primary way we interact with technology in the workplace. And Jabra offers incredible headsets and earbuds, along with powerful video and software solutions that can be a conduit to a more productive way of work. We also strongly believe that to truly unlock the power of generative AI, we need to give it a seat at the table. This means integrating AI into our meetings and daily workflows, enabling it to listen, observe, and contribute. Voice and vision rather than time will be the most effective ways to harness this technology. It's easy to see the benefits of productivity when we consider that voice interactions with AI can greatly enhance efficiency by reducing the time spent on routine activities. Consider this, we speak four times faster than we type. While we think at five to 600 words per minute, we speak at two to 300 words per minute. Typing lags far behind at just 40 to 70 words per minute and even slower on mobile devices. The voice powered future of work isn't something far off, it's already happening. AI technology is advancing faster than we can imagine, often, often working behind the scenes where we don't even notice it. Our partners at Microsoft, Google, and others are already leveraging generative AI powered by voice to boost productivity. And you could start by using some of these tools that we offer right now. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Ben Harvey, Jabra Business Development Manager of Innovative Voice AI Solutions, to speak to you about an exciting software that Jabra has introduced called Engage AI that uses tone-based agent guidance and conversation analytics to supercharge call center performance. Thank you for your time. Awesome, your thank time. you, Jamie. Thank you very much, uh, I appreciate it. So uh, thank you for the introduction. So just before we begin, what I'm going to let everyone know up front is that my portion of the presentation is more related to how Jabra is going to incorporate AI into our hardware moving forward. Some of what I'm about to present over the next 10 minutes or so won't be completely relevant to those of you who are just in boardroom integration and AV, um, something I've been in for the, the better part of two decades myself. But what we want to show you is how our company is evolving from a strictly hardware provider um, and evolving into both video provider as well as a software developer. So I'll go, this presentation is designed to be about 45 minutes. I've condensed it down just to give you the nuts and bolts, give you an overview of what we're doing um, here at Jabra. So, for those of you who don't know, uh, Jabra is the largest headset manufacturer in the world. In fact, there's 15 million contact center agents in the world, 7 million of them, just a hair under half wear a Jabra headset. What we've come to learn over the years is that the tone of a, a person's voice, especially over audio communication, is much more important than the actual words, believe it or not. So we've developed software that focuses on measuring a person's tone as opposed to speech to text what most contact center platforms would measure. So what we've done is develop a widget. You can see it in the bottom corner of my, of my um, screen here. This is working in real time. Right now I'm at a 6.2, so I'm green. Um, I would like to get that a little higher. Typically I'd like to run at about a 7.2 myself. So we'll see throughout the presentation if I can get that up. It will be difficult because I'm going to be speaking a little faster than I should just to get through my content. If we maximize this widget, and I'll slide it over so you can see it, this is what it looks like maximized. You can see everything is in dashes. It doesn't care about the words I'm saying. It doesn't even care about the language I'm speaking. What it's detecting is my voice, my tone of voice. Am I happy? Am I projecting myself? Am I speaking at, at, a, at a, a pace that's acceptable? 
below will be the customer. In this case, that's you who are the, the, the folks that are listening. That's why there's no data because this is a presentation and a one-way conversation. So I'll minimize that so you can see it working throughout my presentation and we'll fly through these slides. So here's the nuts and bolts of a contact center conversation. This is what we want to measure in a typical contact center. Now, this also applies to knowledge workers. It applies to anybody using Teams. We are focusing first and foremost on the contact center because that's where our history is. This will be evolving into all of our hardware over time. You'll notice that there's an asterisk near, near three of these data points, the mute on and off, the background noise, and the microphone position. The reason those asterisks are there is very important. We are now incorporating a chipset in our headsets it's only two models for now. It will be incorporated in our entire portfolio over the next couple of years. But what that's doing is, is beginning the process to replace the hard phone on the desk. So when we moved to IP phones back in the day, 15, 20 years ago, uh, when the boy re revolution sort of took off, we had visibility into the endpoint. When we removed um, the, the hard phones, we lost that visibility on the edge. What Jabra is doing is we're going to put it back. We know that headsets are going to be the preferred endpoint for most people. Some people who have a home office or a contained office are lucky enough to use a speaker phone. Uh, but the vast majority, as Jamie alluded to, are going to be using a headset and be using voice as opposed to the keyboard moving forward. We know now that voice prompts will replace text-based prompts in the vast majority of AI applications moving forward. In fact, uh, Mark Zuckerberg announced just a couple of weeks ago that his company, uh, Meta, will be focusing entirely on voice and not doing any uh, development on text-based prompting. So voice is about to become very, very important. What that also means is that transcription accuracy is very important right now. So if you're wearing Apple EarPod um, Buds, you get about 60 60% transcription accuracy, which is very, very low when you think about it um, in terms of software that you've invested in. But with our technology, and I'll show you half of it software, half of it is hardware, you can expect very, very close to 100% transcription accuracy. What that does is gives you not only a better conversation between you and whoever you're talking to, that's the obvious part, but it cleans up your data and it protects your investment in any other application, AI application you may invest in for your business. So here, I'm going to skip through this really quickly. This is a long portion, but I'm going to give you a quick example. I'll play two audio clips really quickly. This is an example of how speech to text will miss sarcasm. Okay. We are a Danish company, so that's why the accents are. Let's see here. Sorry, folks. Let me go back. It's not going to let me play that audio clip. That's okay. I've... Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, this one's gonna hot. So this is one. Well, I wanna thank your company for delivering just outstanding service, okay? Speech to text is going to look like that's a very positive statement. But when I play this, you're gonna see that in fact, it's not. Well, I want to thank your company for delivering just outstanding service. Okay. So that's an example of traditional software would think that that's a very positive, that would give you a positive result on a customer satisfaction score and it would say, great job. Truth of the matter is that guy's being sarcastic He's not happy. Our software is designed to detect that sarcasm and to give you a hit saying, hey, your, your, your other software is giving you a false positive. You should probably review this call. In the interest of time, I won't give you all the other examples. We'll go through it here as fast as I possibly can. So tone is richer than text. We know that. In fact, when I worked at a Xerox call center early in my career, in my 20s, they taught us to smile while we talk. Even though we were in a contact center, they said that one of the most important things was to smile while you talk because people can hear that in your voice. OK, um, this is the badging opportunities that we give people in real time prompting while they're speaking. As you can see down here, my tone is still 6.7 because I'm talking too quickly. But if I were to improve it, slow down, it would give me that green icon that I'm looking for. And eventually it would start sparkling and saying, hey, you're doing a good job in real time. Alternatively, the opposite is true. If I'm tired, if I'm not projecting myself, it will tell me in real time, hey, it looks like you're a little flat right now. You might want to hop off the call, have a break, what have you. Okay. Supervisor dashboard is web-based uh, through Microsoft Azure. And um, it gives you all the KPIs you could ever imagine in a contact center or even a knowledge worker environment. Again, a little bit repetitive, but small widget on the team, real-time prompts, and it's a gamified experience. We know everybody under the age of 30 loves the, the whole gamified um, experience. That's a huge trend in the industry. 
personalized avatars. Everybody likes a personalized avatar. That's my personalized avatar down there on the right, probably 20 years ago, but that was as close as I could get. And again, most of this is focused on the contact center, so I'm going to skip through it. And I'm going to get to one other really cool piece of technology before I pass it over. So these are really what we've done. These are internal numbers, but this is what it's looking like it can do, okay? 20% increase in customer satisfaction score. The biggest part of that is that it protects an employee. So in a contact center, typically what happens is you call into the contact center. After the call, you are prompted to give a survey. How did the agent do? Well, sometimes the agent does everything possible, just crushes the call, but no matter what, they are not able to turn around the outcome of the call. Whoever the customer called in, they're in a bad mood, they're annoyed, they're super aggravated. It doesn't matter what the agent says, they are still going to smash the one out of five on the customer satisfaction survey that follows. What our software allows it to do is if we can match up that CSTAT score, we can see that the agent actually did a fabulous job, got an eight out of 10 on their tone sentiment um, score. We can then go ahead and listen to that call. And more often than not, what ends up happening is that that score will get canceled out because the agent in fact did everything they should do, but they were just dealing with a very difficult customer that was almost impossible to, uh, to please, if not impossible to please. Came for a fight, was looking for a fight and was gonna leave um, dissatisfied. Technology is very simple. For this, um, it, the technology on the back end is very complex, but as far as the user is concerned, it's very, very simple. It's a small application that sits on the desktop that runs at under 1% processing power. Um, the, the file size is 700 megabytes or so, and the only thing that touches the cloud for security reasons is this, uh, the uh, supervisor dashboard, as well as authentication, um, their name, password. But this is what I really want to show you, and I'll just spend another minute or two on this. This is our newest software. It's a feature of Engage AI, but it's a subset. What it is, is it's using software to clean up sound. So we have been very, very well known for the last 25 years or so for making the world's best noise canceling microphone. What our microphones do is they cancel out background noise from the near side where you're sitting. So if my kids were here in my office right now or my dog was barking, you would not hear it. Where the problem is, and especially as AI develops, we cannot control the far side. So if I was speaking to someone, say, on a roadside who was calling, I, I worked, let's say I worked for an insurance company, someone got into an accident on the roadside and they called their insurance company. There perhaps could be sirens in the background. There could be, you know, there would be obviously road traffic noise. It's very, very difficult to, uh, to hear. So I'm going to play you a quick example of a, of a, of a call. You can hear the background uh, noise. I got a voucher in the mail for this week for a uh, um, consultation, I guess you might say. So you, you can tell, I won't play that whole thing, but you can tell there's a lot of background noise. This is that same call, when enhanced with both our noise canceling microphone on the near side, as well as our software for the, force, the far side. It's called Clear Speech. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I got a little voucher in the mail for this week for a uh, uh, consultation, I guess you might say, appointment. Okay, so I'm going to cut that short just, just because of time. But what I want to reiterate is um, the fact that, you know, the obvious benefit for this is that you're going to have a better flowing conversation between person A and person B. Everyone knows that. But what's even more important and what we haven't even really realized yet, that'll be coming really as soon as next year, is that the data coming from that call is going to drive every other piece of infrastructure, software infrastructure in your business. AI prompts will be voice driven. We know this for a fact now. It's not here yet today, but all all development in future AI applications are voice driven. And it's for the same reason that Jamie alluded to earlier, it's much faster, okay? You can speak much, much quicker uh, using your voice than you can with, um, with the keyboard. And so I'm just gonna play you in, in closing a couple more examples that I really like, and uh, hopefully the sound comes through on this, but this is clear speech and it gives you sort of a real world example of exactly what I'm talking about. So here's the Apollo um, from the sixties. I'm gonna toggle this on and off so you can hear it. 
This is raw audio with the Apollo. Mark, T minus 45, and Gene Cernan made that final guidance alignment. That's the last We're all familiar action with taken that by the crew clip. aboard the space Let's vehicle. Turn speed, John. Now approaching the half minute. T minus 33, T minus 30 seconds, and continuing on now. Continuing on at the T, on at the T minus 26 second mark, T minus 25. We'll guidance uh, okay, release. So I'll, I'll pause that. So, so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. That. That, that you know the original recording from the 60s if we inputted that into an ai application that's using to text or any other technology you're going to get about 60 percent transcription accuracy which means your stoppler is only running at about 60 percent efficiency with our headset devices and or our clear speak software you can expect to get you know 99 to 100 percent transcription accuracy which is just going to make every other application you use in your business uh that much more efficient and uh, give you that return on the investment so that's my Super fast presentation, um, but I would let you know that if you have any questions, by all means, let me know. And if anyone on the call is interested in seeing the full presentation or, or getting a more, uh, you know, a more um, inclusive demo, I'm very easy to find, and uh, that's what I do all day. So by all means, reach out to Jamie, and he'll connect us. Any questions? We do have a question. Awesome. All right, well done. The question is, if it's the chipset that gives these results working with the software, how is the accuracy rate when using them with other platforms like Zoom's AI companion? Does the rate go down? So our software will work with any other manufacturer, including other heads that uh, manufacture. The, the three uh, uh, data points that I pointed out in the presentation with the asterisk, those are exclusive to Jabra. Um, so that is, you know, a feature set that we use to sort of sell our premium contact center headsets. But other than that, the software is completely agnostic. What you do need in order for the software to work is a soft phone. It will not work with a cell phone. It does not work with a hard phone. Soft phone only. And the soft phone, the other little, little caveat is the soft phone has to be based on that user's PC. It can't be thin client based. Um, there are some workarounds, a bit more complicated, but that's really the, the, the main qualifiers. Excellent. I do not see any more questions, um, which gives us a little bit more time for our prize. Oh. Um, I, I do want to thank Rob Nicole. and Ben, and of course, Jamie. I think Rob has a presentation as well. Um, yeah, I think, are you, can you guys oh, hear me? well, good. Yeah. You guys hear me? Yeah, okay. I think yeah, I had the, uh, the, uh, the opposite mute action going where I was, you know, uh, the client got a little confused. But um, yeah, I'm going to steal the slides just for a second, Nicole, because we would, be, we would be remiss on this call not to talk a little bit about meeting room stuff. And I'm the meeting we're room We're thrilled. Nerd. We've got time for it. Awesome. Well, we're... Thank you for speaking yeah, up. I know, I know we, were going, we were going quick here. So, uh, but yeah, we can, we, we've got a little bit more. So, um, and again, I was on earlier today. I love what Ben was talking about because I think it's a really interesting combination of AI we can bring and sit in between things. But also, you know, he had one of his tidbits earlier in there about, you know, just the ability for for our devices, high quality headsets acting as like rich food for AI. Um, and again, that idea of, you know, all of these tools we're about to be using in all the different ways that different companies and all of these ecosystems. I mean, again, it, this is I've been in and out of this throughout the day because it's so interesting hearing what all kinds of different companies are working on um, that that we all we're not at a point where anybody can do it all right that it is kind of a it's an ecosystem of of things giving data to other things to then turn that into insight done that work that's 80 percent of the way done all that good stuff so this value chain of of um uh, it, it, that's kind of the nature of the ecosystem right now is super interesting in my opinion so i've got another little i gotta give you the overview of what we do in in the meeting room stuff and give you a sense for what we do but then it's just a little example of another way in which a different part of jabra is kind of also acting as that like source of food right rich signal for uh for something that is um that is otherwise i think a very uh hot topic in the ai world making it work a little bit better in our own little kind of little wrinkle and in, in how it works so before i jump into the example what do we do panicast 50 is is the solution series that people would have heard of uh over the last four and five years um and there we go, the first, there we go. So what are our native habitats for the Panacast experience? I'm gonna talk a bit about what kind of rooms we solve for, the ways we solve for them, 
And then I'll get into a little bit of Gary talked at lunch right in the, the midday about really that there's kind of, the, you know, intelligence and AI on the edge. And then there's what happens in the middle, kind of more in the cloud. So I'm going to give an overview of the things we're doing at the edge and this journey we've been on because the Panic has 50, uh, you know, in its initial product was going on three or four years old, but it's really even until recently, we've continued to add capabilities to what that camera can do on the edge. Um, and there's examples of how that partnership we've been had with, for instance, like Microsoft, it has enriched uh, really the experience in a meeting room. So where do we play? Panicast 50 experience for Jabra is really focused on that majority of rooms that fall into these two buckets, small rooms, medium rooms, rooms that are 20 feet and less in depth, uh, you know, and, and, you know, call it up to 10, 12 people is really our native habitat as an, as kind of a, an all in one bar that, that combines a novel camera video experience with a kind of all in one simple um, audio device where the microphones and speakers are located at the front of the room and all integrated. Uh, so these are kind of one way of looking at more traditional room layouts. But again, our video technology, if you don't know, we have this very you know 180 degree panorama that really solves uniquely for rooms where width happens. And these are rooms, obviously, like in the kind of the, the, the example focus or huddle room where, you know, the the rise of the the D shaped table, the guitar pick table, where oftentimes those front, those first two seats at the front of the table are simply too wide for traditional cameras to see. Um, that is a that's a, a, a source of a lot of the traction that we've gotten over the last few years. Um, and again, these are if you've paid attention to the things that come out of Redmond, these are kind of vignettes of some of the room layouts that, that uh, the guys in the hive were working on. But again, a lot of creativity around um, new room layouts as people come back or, you know, more and more compelled or called back to the office to make sure that meeting rooms work as well as we all got used to virtual meetings to work when we were all at home on our personal AV. So these are kind of our native habitats. What are our solutions? We have the Panacast 50. It's a USB video bar. It's what you kind of see here below this little display in a laptop. The Panacast 50, you see us marketed a lot as a BYOD bar. It really is. It's a it's an a la carte USB audio and video device that get deployed that gets deployed honestly in a wide variety of ways. I'm a sales engineer. I'm the guy that talks to a customer who says, yeah, I heard about your thing. And I say, before I'm going to tell you anything, what are you doing in your rooms? How do you want it to work? Who do you want the human to do when they walk into the room? How are they getting the meeting started? So this device is the, the USB Panacast 50, which was our first entry into this kind of small and medium room all in one bar works in a lot of ways. You want to just have a person connect their laptop via HDMI and USB, use the Panacast 50. Are you one of those companies that still has a, a a workstation under the table in the in the meeting room and the keyboard and mouse are still like the meeting room user interface? Panacast 50 is a great USB peripheral in scenarios like that. We also have great partnerships with the Barcos and the Screen Beams and the Air Teams of the world where there's kind of this idea of kind of a next gen simplifying Crestron with their air media stuff that that where you know cable reduce the cabling and, and offer a simple workflow for an end user to just connect their laptop to the AV in the room, start the meeting from their laptop. So that's a, that's one big scenario that that a, our Panic has 50 USB bar does. We got a lot of feedback and we got the certifications to get that bar deployed in Microsoft Teams rooms on Windows environments and also Zoom room environments. We got the feedback as Jobber that said, gosh, it'd be really easy if you had a Teams room in a box with a Jobber part number on it. So we partnered with Lenovo to create what we call the Panicast 50 room system. It's the same USB Panicast 50, but with Lenovo's compute and controller, and those come in Teams and Zoom variants. We also have a number of partnerships, particularly with Crestron and Lenovo, where they have bundles that have the Panicast 50 in it. So again, that USB device being a kind of very multi-purpose device that can be deployed in a lot of different ways that solve for popular, modern, UC-centric meeting room designs. What we announced in the last year and, and are seeing a lot of momentum with is a lot of people are going up Android-based appliance route, right? They don't want the PC in the room, we're past the BYOD, but they still want a native Teams room or Zoom room experience, but they want it with purpose-built hardware that's based Android-based. This the, the rise of these appliances has been quick over the last three and four years. Um, and, and so we had to make a new version of the Panicast 50 hardware to have HDMI output ports and have the Android card built into it. So we've got that and, and build our own controller. So we've got that too. So really these are kind of the primary scenarios that our Panacast 50 experience is now able to be deployed in. 
So that was quick. Again, from an edge functionality perspective, what do we do at our end of the USB cable or what are we doing inside of our device that that helps create or fuel experiences um, that, you know, for, again, we always think about the people sitting in the meeting room, but a camera's benefactor, the, the, the people who benefit from a great video and audio experience in a meeting room are the people at the far end, the people that are re joining remotely. So what are we doing to help solve for that? I talked about the 180 degree field of view. I'm gonna change my camera real quick to a Panacast 50. I was using our P20 webcam. You can see what the what the wide field of view does. You see that Danny's hiding down there in the corner and Mac is way over there. 180 degrees, you know, that's three lenses that we are stitching together using processing on board. There's an example kind of at the the base level of our video experience of some pretty innovative processing happening on our in our device. That's the, the baseline, but you don't want that giant panorama all the time. So when we launched from the very beginning, we took that panorama, we have a group view mode, right? When when there's two people in the room, we just see them. When there's five people, we, we, we react to that and we are able to frame occupancy in the room as it happens. Most cameras, some companies, some organizations value having a mode. They want the room to focus on an active talker in any given time and highlight them at the, in my opinion, at the expense of the other people in the room. So we have a speaker view mode. We call that virtual director. When the room is idle, you see everyone. When Rob, as I, I'm glad I don't have Engage AI on my desktop, by the way, because it would be red all the time. But when Rob starts sucking up all the air out of a meeting again, it's just going to look at me and you won't see anybody else rolling their eyes. So we have that mode. Then we got more feedback about what it meant to come back to the office. And there was this idea of if there's three or four people in the room, we want to be able to see each of them, but close. We don't want to see them in one big view. So we did a, a grid view. We call it dynamic composition. We can kind of highlight, you know, four to six people. We'll, we'll batch them in their own little, you know, put two people in a square if they're close enough together. We can do a two by two grid in that one video feed that we are creating in the camera. So we've got a mode like that. This is feedback that's consistent because other companies have kind of done these similar things. We got the feedback. Our, our camera is uniquely uh, strong at seeing sideways out of a window uh, in a meeting room with a glass wall. So we got told, gosh, it'd be great if you could get the camera to ignore people that are out that are in view, but outside the room. So we have an intelligent meeting space mode available on our USB bar. It will come later to the other one that that uh, that we where you can set a width and a depth of the room and using algorithms and using, you know, our ability to the the uh, sharp guy was talking about being able to estimate what a thing is by size and shape. Oh, it's a backpack. It's a potted plant. We can kind of guess how far away someone is. And we and if they are beyond what we have set for the virtual boundary, we won't frame to them. We're not we're not like, you know, dropping in a virtual background, but but we won't react to someone who's in that, you know, that little tiny room that I'm showing you. That's a, a real room in our Cupertino office. It's the glass wall is at the back and the camera would regularly respond to people who were out in the lobby. Now it and now it won't. I'm going to talk about this one in a second, but here's an example where Microsoft had some things that we would we could if we could do it for them, they could do some neat audio things. So we've we've Im implemented a, a mode in our Panacast 50 where we can do audio in a way that brings to life some functionality in Teams rooms on Windows systems that our mutual customers really appreciate. Same thing with this one, multi-stream dynamic composition, the idea of a USB camera providing multiple camera stream, multiple video streams over the USB cable, not just the one video feed you usually get from a USB camera, but actually sending multiple streams over the USB cable. So a Teams rooms on Windows endpoint can do some cool things. Um, we've also on the appliance side thought about with that one, that single view mode, when you, when you have the two by two grid, you're losing a context view. So can, is there some, some layouts we can do in a single view that can improve the ability to see everyone in a room, but also highlight the after talker. So with our video bar system, we've actually implemented a new single stream composite mode that kind of marries the best of a group view and a composite view where we're seeing multiple individuals in a room. And lastly, we just turned on most recently in our appliance support for Zoom's multi-stream smart gallery, where we are, I believe, among the, you know, the, the, the one or among the few who can do up to six streams out of a meeting room, one for the full room view, plus five additional streams for people in the room. And each of those individual streams can be kind of sliced four ways. So we can provide an up-close view of a lot of people in a small and medium-sized room. And these are all things that we didn't know we were going to do at the beginning, but that uh, because we put some of that, we had the edge processing cap there, those capabilities were in our devices, we could add these as, as 
request from the market came or our partner said, hey, it would be cool if you could. So an example on this, and then I will we'll, we'll stop for uh, Q&A, and I think we'll still be a little bit early. Um, so an example, a Panicast 50 is deployed with a, with a Windows-based Microsoft Teams room. I took this screen cap in my office, if you couldn't tell, because I already spoiled the Danny's over there in the corner. So, so again, this is somebody remote joining a meeting where my office is in the meeting as a, as a meeting room. So Danny and I are in here in the meeting room together. And there's another meeting room that's actually outside that door in my office, or, and I've got the Lego people. So we've got a meeting room that has a normal group view video feed and a meeting room that has this different video feed. This, these three streams are one meeting room coming in. And, and these are features that Microsoft has been kind of talking about for a while, but uh, our, our, the Panicast 50 now has the features to be enabled to fuel some of these experiences. So what are they? Our feature is multi-stream dynamic composition. What it enables is for the Teams rooms on Windows room to actually send all three of those video feeds up to the cloud meeting and then remote de you know, desktops that have joined that meeting receive these three video feeds. It's the active talker and a most recent active talker plus a full view of the room. And this, these feeds are lumped together. They can, uh, when there's a lot of endpoints in a, in a meeting, they get, the rooms get outsized. So it offers a differentiated view of the people in the room that, that uh, the combination of our ability to provide this data, this video feeds to Microsoft's Teams room on Windows application that knows to look for it fuels this experience. The other thing that's hiding in plain sight here is I am in the meeting room and it says RHMTR2 Crestron Flex. That's just one of my MTRs in my house. But my name is over my my video feed. And this is because my the tenant that I'm using has enabled face recognition and I as an end user have enrolled for that. So now this is very much approximating the experience I'm having here at home in my desktop client, even though I went to the office and went into the room that day, I'm not anonymized. And if Ben had heard of this Rob guy, but the meeting was in the meeting, he wouldn't might not know that that's Rob who's sucking up all the air in the meeting. But now that name is on me in the meeting room, just like it is if I'd stayed home that day. So we're getting a more high fidelity, not just for the, the people, but a more approximating the experience we have at home when we go to the office and we go to the meeting room and we have this type of technology where, uh, uh, you know, something like our Panicast 50 is in there in a solution where we've co-created some of these experiences or we've done things to support Microsoft's functionality. The other thing is if you look over here in the transcript, our intelligent speaker functionality means I have also enrolled my voice and when I speak from this meeting room, the transcript shows not that the meeting room said things, it knows that Rob is the one that was saying these things from that meeting room. So that's again, high fidelity information that, that now with the rise of, of you know, co-pilot and being able to have smart meeting recaps and the like, if I go to the meeting room that day and I say, I'll take that action item, the smart recap will reflect that Rob took the action item, not that the meeting room or someone inside of it said they would do it. So. Just an example, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, if you have more questions on this stuff or which product does which feature, reach out, you know, I'll, as always, we're here to, to help talk through all these things. But just wanted to share that example of how, what we can do on the edge and what our partners can do with their software and their cloud and what they want for their end users to be able to experience and their customers. Uh, our partnerships are really helping us kind of be able to bring some of those experiences to life. Thanks.